This lecture will provide a basic introduction to the concept of hypothesis testing. And in fact, this is what we're going to be doing, hypothesis testing, for the remainder of this semester as well as all of next semester in 294. It's really the ultimate goal of what we're doing in psychological science or behavioral science more generally. The material here can be found in chapter 7 of your textbook, specifically on pages 183 to 188. Now as always, I like to kind of start out with the big picture, and it's important to keep this in mind. Before getting lost in some of the details of what we're doing, or some of the technical way that statistics might be presented, okay, it's important again to realize what we're really doing. What is our ultimate goal? Well, we started out this semester talking about formulating hypotheses. That is, specific testable predictions that ideally were based off of theory or previous research. Okay, and we talked about some good qualities of these, such as being falsifiable, parsimonious, and so forth and so on. Well, now what we want to do is to try and determine exactly how are we going to test these hypotheses. Now, notice how I'm saying this. When we talk about testing hypotheses, one thing you need to be very careful about is to never say that you can prove any hypothesis right or wrong. So I don't ever want to see you guys writing that the data proves our hypothesis okay? or that uh, previous research has shown such and such and therefore it proves the theory that whatever the theory is. Okay? We can never prove any hypothesis or any theory right or wrong. Okay? And that's important, in fact, a pet peeve of mine, so you're going to want to be careful and make sure that that word never shows up in any of your writing this semester or next. What we can do is to simply determine whether or not one hypothesis is more likely than another. Okay, so we can talk about the degree of support for a specific hypothesis being true or not being true, but we never really know for sure whether a hypothesis or a theory is right or wrong. Okay, we can never prove something because we never know every single instance of every single behavior. We can't prove that a drug works. We may see that it works in most of the people or even in fact all of the people that we've tested it on. But that doesn't prove that this drug is always going to reduce depression or help with an attention disorder or whatever the case may be for any single person to whom the drug is administered. But what we can do again is determine whether or not it's likely that this drug is improving the behavior or whether a certain study method is leading to better performance or better test scores or so forth and so on. Okay, and we can do this using the notions of probability and some of the related concepts that were introduced last week. So let's start out, start out with just some basic introduction of uh, the nomenclature that we're going to be using. Your research hypothesis, that is the hypothesis that you truly believe in, that you want to support, the one that you expect is true. That is that, for example, that this drug is having uh, an impact or that your study method is working. Okay, whatever hypothesis you firmly believe in, that is your research hypothesis. Okay, and now, um, different types of system and different abbreviations are used in different courses and different instructors. What I'm going to do is use the subscript H sub A to be consistent with your textbook here, which a lot of times stands for the alternative hypothesis. You'll also see this as H sub R sometimes for research hypothesis or H sub 1. Um, and the reason for that is because it's contrasted with what's often referred to as the null hypothesis, H sub zero or H naught, as it's sometimes called. The null hypothesis is the one that statistically you are actually testing. And I know this concept can be a little bit confusing for people sometimes. Okay? There's one hypothesis that you really believe in, but statistically what you're testing is the other one. And this goes back to part of what was covered in chapter one as well in your textbook is that it's actually easier to find evidence against something than it is to find evidence for something. Okay, if you want to know whether or not it's true that pigs fly, as soon as you find one flying pig, that's going to provide support for that hypothesis. But in order to figure out that pigs don't fly, then you have to go and look at every single pig, throw it off a cliff, and see whether or not it flies. Okay, now that's not really going to be feasible. Okay, the point here is simply that finding one instance of something to contradict what you believe is a lot easier than trying to go out and look at every single instance of something to make sure that it confirms what you believe. So it's a lot easier to disprove or contradict something than it is to prove it. Okay? Now I know I've used the word prove here now a few times, saying specifically that's not what we're going to do, but the same thing goes for trying to find support for a hypothesis or against it. Okay? It's a lot easier to find evidence against something 
So what we do is kind of set up this straw man, the null hypothesis, and say, okay, what we're going to try and do is to find evidence against this guy, because finding evidence against the null hypothesis in turn then is leading us to support our actual research hypothesis in which we firmly believe. Now this can only be the case if your research and null hypotheses are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. In other words, if we're finding evidence against the null hypothesis, if our research hypothesis is mutually exclusive and exhaustive, then that means that if the null isn't supported, the only other potential option is the research hypothesis. Because these two together are exhaustive, that means there's no other possible situation that we can support. So in general, what we're going to be doing the entire rest of this semester as well as next semester, and in fact the rest of your time as a psychology major, if not beyond, is doing hypothesis testing in a very basic sense. In particular, whenever you develop a hypothesis or a claim about the world, all we're going to do is determine what would the population, in particular what would the population distribution, look like if the null hypothesis were true. And then what we can do is to go collect some data and then say, okay, given our data, our sample, is it likely that this null hypothesis is in fact true? In other words, if we know what the world is supposed to look like if the null hypothesis is true, then we collect a sample of data, then we can say, does our data in fact look like this or does it not? If it looks like what we expect given the null hypothesis, then we're going to support the null hypothesis. If the data that we have we think is very unlikely to have come from the same distribution, if it looks not very much like what we expect to find given the null hypothesis, then we're going to reject the null hypothesis and support the alternative hypothesis, that is, our research hypothesis that we really wanted to support in the first place. Now before we look at an example, one thing I want to do is to make clear exactly how we're going to be stating hypotheses. Again, because this may have differed across different instructors in 261, and just to make sure how we're going to be doing things this semester. Okay, so let's say that we have a hypothesis. We think truly that alcohol affects reaction time. We think that drinking alcohol has an effect on reaction time. Okay, now that is what we truly believe. That is, it is our alternative or research hypothesis. So if what we had is a group of students who drank uh, non-alcoholic brew and another group of students who drank alcohol and we wanted to compare them, okay, then what we think is that the alcohol group is not going to look like the control group. We think that alcohol has an effect on reaction time. Now based off, off of what we already know, you guys should be able to state whether or not this is a directional or a non-directional hypothesis. Well, which one is it? Indeed, this is a non-directional hypothesis. We're not saying whether or not the people who drink alcohol are going to be faster or slower. We just say that alcohol has an effect. Okay? And in this case, our research hypothesis is stated that the alcohol group and the control group are not going to equal in terms of their reaction times. Well, if this is our research hypothesis, the way then that we formulate our null hypothesis is, again, it has to be mutually exclusive and exhaustive with our research hypothesis. That is, it has to cover all the other bases. Well, if we think that our research hypothesis is the alcohol group is not equal to the control group, it's pretty simple then to see that our null hypothesis is that the alcohol group is equal to the control group. Now, this is a very basic situation, and for any non-directional hypothesis, you can think about formulating it in this sort of sense, at least in a two-group comparison. Either the groups are equal, there's no effect of something, that's the null hypothesis, or the groups are unequal, there is an effect of whatever it is I'm looking at, that's the research hypothesis. Well, what about a directional hypothesis, such as that alcohol impairs reaction time? Well, now, in this situation, we're looking at a specific direction in terms of the effect of alcohol, in particular that it's going to slow down reaction times. Okay? So in terms of reaction time, what that would actually mean is we would expect to find, as our research hypothesis states, that the alcohol group is going to show greater reaction times than the control group. It's going to take longer for them to respond on whatever task we give them.
Now you have to be careful here because if this is our research hypothesis that the alcohol group we expect to see greater reaction times than the control group, then what would our null hypothesis be? Remember, it has to cover all of the other bases. So is it still just going to be simply that the alcohol group is equal to the control group? Now think about this for a minute. Then what are we going to suggest? Which of these two hypotheses are we going to support if we find out that the alcohol group is actually faster than the control group? That is, that their reaction times are less than the control group. If that is the data pattern that we find, does that support our research hypothesis? No, because we said the alcohol group should be greater than the control. So then it must support our null hypothesis, right? No, because our alcohol group is not equal to the control group, and that's the way this null hypothesis is formulated. So what we have to do is to be sure that the null hypothesis does include all of the other possibilities. In this case, for a non-directional hypothesis, you have to make sure that the null hypothesis includes the other direction. In particular here, the null hypothesis would be that the alcohol group was not faster, or was, sorry, was not slower than the control group. That is, that it was less than or equal to the control group. So you have to be very careful here because, again, it's important based off of the notions of probability that we're looking at that these two things have to be mutually exclusive and exhaustive. That is, whatever your research hypothesis is, make sure that your null hypothesis includes everything else. You also have to be careful to make sure that any result you find only provide support for one hypothesis. Okay, so if you're getting very specific about your hypotheses in terms of magnitude, you can't have a research hypothesis that says something happens greater than one-third of the time, and your null hypothesis be that it happens less than two-thirds of the time, because those two hypotheses now are not mutually exclusive. They overlap. If you find out your data suggests that something occurs half the time, that actually then provides support for both those hypotheses as I stated them. Okay, now that's not as common of a situation. Most commonly the way people will slip up on this is again in terms of these non-directional or in terms of these directional hypotheses. Okay, so just be careful about how you state those. So what we said then when we do hypothesis testing, again in the most general sense, what we're going to be doing is saying here's what we expect to find if our null hypothesis is true. And then we collect some data, and we say, well, based off of our data, is it unlikely to have come from this distribution that we expected? If the null hypothesis is true, we should, we should see this. If we're not seeing this, is that just sort of a random fluctuation? Is that chance? Or is it too unlikely to have come from that population distribution? Well, then what we have to do is to just be very precise about how we define unlikely. And what it's common to do is to establish a standard level for which we're going to reject that null hypothesis as being too unlikely. And in particular, this definition of unlikely, when expressed as a probability, is what we refer to as alpha. And our alpha level in the psychology behavioral science is typically set at 0.05 or 5%. Okay, the exact probability estimate based on our sample data is called the p-value. So, we might have a specific set of data that provides us with a p-value, the probability of finding the result that we did, if the null hypothesis is true, is equal to the p-value. So, if you see data that's reported with a p of 0.02, what that means is, if the null hypothesis is in fact true, the probability of finding the data that was found in that study is only 0.02 or it would only happen 2% of the time. Now, because that is less than the alpha of 0.05, or 5%, we say that's too unlikely. It's probably not the case that the null hypothesis is true, because if it's true, then we're not going to find data like this very often, only 2% of the time. Well, we think that's too unlikely, and so we're going to claim, no, we don't think the null hypothesis is true. We're going to reject it in favor of our research or alternative hypothesis. And that is what hypothesis testing is all about.